Let's, you know what, before we go to Job, get, get Job 23, but um, let's also, let's start in Matthew 22, just as a um, way to start things out for tonight. Let me turn this light on, even though it casts a shadow. Oh, hey, and I can see. Matthew 22, let's look at verses 31 and 32. Very quickly. But as touching the resurrection, this is the word of Jesus, as, as, as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that that which was spoken to, uh, unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but the living. So I guess I just wanted to start out by thanking parents that they brought their children here on Halloween or All Hallows Eve. Good job, parents. Um, instead of raising little socialists that go door to door begging for food that they didn't earn. That's the one bad side of it. The other bad side of it is that it is a worship of the God of the dead. And that, according to Jesus, is not the God that we worship. And we know who that is. That's Satan. So whether or not, you know, we turn it into dressing them up in super, as superheroes or whatever um, we do um, uh, to Americanize things, this is Satan's holiday. This is his day. It is the celebration of death promoted by begging. And we're talking raising real socialists here, right? Because if your lights are out and you don't give anything to them, what do they do? They egg the house, <laughs> right? Raised right from knee high to a grasshopper. That person doesn't want to give you something that you didn't earn, don't like them. Isn't that something? That's, that's the political side of things. That's just raising children right. On top of that, spiritually speaking, Satan is the god of the dead. There's absolutely no reason for us to go out there and dress our children up like zombies and witches and, and warlocks and all those other things. There's absolutely no reason. So thank you again for bringing your children to church on a Wednesday night in a church that doesn't pretend to do Halloween and just call it something else. Amen. Right, trunk or treat. Yeah, whatever they call it, you know. And, and I, again, I don't have any problem with a harvest party. Grace Gospel's got a harvest party. We're going to have a harvest party. That's fine. But just doing everything that Halloween does and then just bringing it in the church, well, that's just bringing the world into the church. So thank you. Appreciate it. Um, now, as far as tonight's message goes, we're in Job. We're in chapter 23. And the timing of tonight's message, I believe, is good. Let's consider it a foreword or an introduction to Sunday's message, which is called Repent and Believe the Gospel. Um, and again, children will be in the service, so praise the Lord for that. Just dawned on me when Tom and I had prayer on, on Tuesday with Ryan. We just said, hey, wait a minute, what about the children? Let's get them in. And so... So uh, Sunday, Lord willing, we're going to talk about what the Lord asks an unsaved person to turn from. We're going to define that from the scriptures. And to whom he asks us to turn. We know that that's the Lord Jesus Christ. We're saved here. Um, so you'll get all of that um, and maybe be a little stunned at what I teach. Um, but it's Bible, and in, unless you can prove me wrong through the Bible, I'm going to go forward with it. Um, tonight, we're talking about the sin of self-righteousness. This belief, contrary to the Word of God, contrary to honest judgment of ourselves, contrary to the reality of who we are in flesh, in the Adam, this belief that says, I am better than for which God is willing to give me credit. I'm better. So let me put it into modern vernacular. I'm a good person, 
And if God is a good God, he will recognize my goodness. That's how the world thinks. And we're going to see that through the person of Job. Um, man, it, it doesn't... It, it, it never ceases to amaze me the levels to which man will go to create God in his own image. Because that's what he's doing. He's been doing it since the fall, and he's doing it today, making his own little gods. We'll talk about that this weekend, Lord willing. So be in prayer about that. Verses 1 through 7, let's read them, pray, and we'll get to, we'll get to business. Then Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. Will he plead against me with his great power? No, but he would put strength in me. There the righteous might dispute with him, so should I be delivered forever from my judge. Now, if you haven't gotten all that when I read it, and in the manner in which I read it, hopefully by the end of tonight you'll understand what Job's doing here. Father, help us to see the truth through the word of truth tonight. And as always, that it might sink down into those cracks and recesses of sometimes our very hard and unwatered hearts. And I pray, Lord, that there would be a little space at least where there's soft ground, fertile ground, where a seed can take root. And um, for those who listen via YouTube, Lord, I have no idea who might stumble across this video. But perhaps there's someone that's trusting in their innate goodness that is going to listen to this message. I pray that, they, that uh, the word would not fall on hard soil, but that their hearts would be open to hearing from your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so verses 1 and 2 says, Then Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Fancy King James English. What does it mean? Man has a very bitter complaint against the Almighty. We're just going to use Job tonight as a picture of all men, self-righteous men. And they've got a complaint against God. Namely, that complaint is this. The bitter things that have befallen me in this life are heavier upon me than I even know how to put into words. This life that you gave me, God, that you could do better with, God, at best, I just groan over this pain. I don't even got words. And there isn't really a man or a woman on this planet, certainly not in this room, that couldn't find a way to identify with or relate to Job's plight. This is the truth. Sometimes depression hits me. Sometimes it hits you. It was never the case before I entered the ministry. That's the truth. It's not sarcastic in any way, shape, or form. It's just the truth. This is a spiritual battle. We talked about this in the pre, uh, previous message on Sunday. And yet I've not gone through what Job has gone through. Right? But I still find a way to relate to a man that says, man, I'm going through something I don't even know how to describe in the words. I'm just groaning over this. You've not gone through what Job has gone through. Can you not relate? So what's the problem here? The problem is, is that man relates to the plight of man. But man does not relate to the nature, the judgment, or the holiness of God. 
If he did, he wouldn't question. But because he relates to man and man's plight, well, then everything is God's fault. Because God forbid that man would be always wrong. He can't be. We're innately good, right? So we read the story and instantly begin putting ourselves in the place of Job. What he may have felt. Maybe how would I have handled the situation if I had gone through that? Probably not as strong as Job. Being honest. But do we ever put ourselves in the place of God? In this story. Put ourselves in the place of God and wonder why man charges God with the things that man does not even comprehend or understand. And yet he'll charge God with folly. And so what I'm preaching to you tonight, to me tonight, is that all things of eternal value need to be weighed in light of an eternal source. I am not an eternal source. You are not an eternal source. Can we all agree to that? And the argument goes, if the eternal source is the creator, and I can't find him, and we know, hey, the Bible says he hides himself behind the dark cloud. He's put that firmament and that sea of glass there. Our sins also have separated us from God. He's hidden himself. He will not see. He will not hear. How do we tap the eternal source? Look at the wording in Job. He says, even... Today is my complaint bitter. Job is speaking like man. He's speaking for the day. He's not speaking for the eternal or with the eternal in mind. And so how would our eternal creator then counsel us with eternal matters and find a way to do so to a very finite mind that's prone to wander and is a very selfish in nature. We'll go to Psalm 95. Keep your place here. Job says, Today my complaint is bitter. Well, here's how God would respond. It's not... Anything that you wouldn't expect. I'm not going to teach you anything tonight. I don't think that you don't already know. Hopefully we just impress it upon you. Psalm 95 verses 7, 8, and 9 says, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today. There's the phrase that Job uttered. Today if you will hear his voice. Right? No, no. Job says, today, if God would hear my voice, God would respond, today, if you will hear my voice. Harden not your heart, verse 8, as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Now, are you getting that? Because there's not a man in Israel that wouldn't have said, God tempted us through 40 years. God says, no, no. You tempted me for 40 years. Do you see that? I mean, isn't that just interesting? Job being this type of a, just a self-righteous man saying, today, if God would hear me. And God says, wait a minute, no, today if you'll hear me. I made you, you didn't make me. That's like the child telling the parent, would you sit down and listen to me? I'm going to put you over my knee, boy. Well, hopefully you do. Hopefully you're taking control, moms and dads. i got to stop dealing 
with the matter of today from the perspective of me. Finite, oft ignorant, selfish, carnal, living one day at a time because I don't know how to live any other way. I'm not infinite. I stare at seconds as they tick on a clock. You think God is staring at seconds? One day at a time, one hour at a time, one minute at a time, one second of a time, life under the sun. Man is of the earth, earthy, 1 Corinthians 15, 47. And somehow he assumes that he can reason with the eternal from the finite perspective. And that the eternal God must somehow come down to his level to hear his arguments. Again, making God in our own image. This is who I think God should be. And if he's not, he's a disappointment to me. Man will always lower the standard rather than rise up to meet God's standard. It just is. It's our nature. Okay, let's keep reading. Verses 3 and 4. Oh, that I knew where I might find him. Exclamation point. That I might come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. On Sunday in our Genesis study, we took a look at the stars that God created. He made the stars also. We talked about the sun and the moon and, and uh, that which man has spent billions of dollars exploring outer space, if not trillions at this point, right? And why? Why explore that firmament? Yes, explore, exploration for the purpose of exploration will always be a motivation, you know, curiosity and all. But I'm telling you, man is looking for God. I think he's looking to not find him personally. But for those who are genuinely curious to find him, that curiosity began all the way back some 6,000 years ago in a garden that you and I have never seen. And since man's estrangement from God, he's been trying to hunt for him. And isn't it interesting that, number one, man innately searches for God. I've been saying this for years. Man has a God-shaped hole in his heart. He doesn't maybe understand it. He doesn't understand how to look or how to search because, again, he's finite, so he thinks like a man. But he's on the search. He's just looking in the wrong places, and it's usually in the mirror. Amen. Number two, the reality is deep, deep down, and I'm talking deep, deep down, he also innately knows that that search will bring him through the dark cloud of the firmament. He knows it. This is where God's seat has to be found. It's amazing. And yet I find something else amazing that I find in the text. If I could build a rocket and zoom out of Earth's atmosphere, called the first heaven. If I could fly past the moon, if I could light speed past Luke Skywalker and warp speed past Captain Kirk, if I could penetrate the deep and burst through the frozen face thereof, and if I could stand before the God of all creation and not die by his holy presence, I would not show up to praise him. 
Job says, I'd show up to argue with him. That's man. It's right there in the text. This is a, this is a righteous man according to God. This is the best of the best. He says, if I get a chance to see God, I'm going to argue with him. Will man set in order his cause before his creator? He thinks he will, but his mouth will be stopped. Will man fill his mouth with arguments against his creator? He thinks he will, and you've heard people say it. If I just had a chance to ask God this question. Sure, right, okay, Job. He'll stop your mouth too. When God does finally show up, Job gets maybe two sentences out and just says, you know what, I'm just going to shut up now. I abhor myself. So despite what man thinks he would do in the presence of God, in the presence of God, it'll be a little different. And you better ask yourself whether or not you're prepared to be in that presence. Because if you plan to go there with an argument for your self-righteousness, your home is hell. That's the truth. As if it hadn't gotten already presumptuous on the part of Job, let's keep reading verse 5. Let me get a sip of water here. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. This is a King James way of basically saying, I know exactly what God's going to say to me. Is that right? Because, you know, the Lord said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Isaiah 55 and verse 8. And yet man basically thinks he knows what God should say, how God should think, what should motivate God, and what his response to me as I argue with God should be. And that's, oh, you're right, you're right, you're right, I'm sorry. I, was, I didn't know what I was talking about. I, I'm, I'm just an idiot. Teach me. Please, show me. Show me the way. Go to Ezekiel chapter 18. When you show someone from God's word that he doesn't think like them, you know what their response typically is? I'm going to show you from Ezekiel. Ezekiel 18, look at verse 23. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? This is the Lord speaking. Let that sink in. Because for all of the preaching, you know, and I, you hear this a lot, because I preach the gospel. I preach it out on the street corners. Obviously, I preach it from this pulpit. I'm not shy about it. I don't preach it with fluff. But I want everyone to understand that God does not, and I do not want anyone to perish. Amen. I don't stand up here and preach you're going to hell in your self-righteousness because I'm happy about it. If I was happy about it, I wouldn't convince you otherwise. Go. So I preach it, not only because the Lord asked me to, but because if His Spirit's in me, and, and I think it is, then I'm not happy about anyone going to hell. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live. But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? 
All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. Get that now. One sin nullifies it all. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in the sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. Yet ye say, here's man's argument, the way of the Lord is not equal. It's not fair. That's man's response. But God's response would be, Hear now, O house of Israel, or Job, or whoever stands before the Almighty with such arguments. Is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? Listen, all you have to do is take a look at politics and answer that question. Because the people proclaiming equality the most are the most unequal people you will ever encounter. So no, God, my ways are not unequal because it's me. I've got to be right. Come on, that's just... Listen, we all have a very difficult time being told we're wrong. I don't care who you are. I don't care how much of the spirit you got in you. If you're walking in that flesh, it's very easy to just go, I'm right here, I'm right here. And if you've got the kind of spirit that I've got, which is a problem, well, then you're going to start, you know, throwing down. But this is... This is man, supreme in his thoughts, sovereign in his counsel, saved by the right hand of my righteousness. It's man. Now, he'll use religion as that form of what have you, but it's still a religion that he himself created. God didn't create it. It's still a formation of his own hands. It's still an image that his fingers carved out of wood. His imagination, his heart reasoned and penned down in false documents. Verses 6 and 7. And we'll close. Will he plead against me with his great power? No. But he would put strength in me. Don't you just love this presumption here? Once God hears my speech, because I got a doozy prepared, he would definitely change his mind about me. You mean because God doesn't know something about you or what you're going to say? God knows you better than you know you. He knows what you're going to say before you think it. And yet you think you're going to change God's mind? Listen, God is reasonable, and his mind has been changed in Scripture. But you are not going to convince God that you are righteous enough to earn heaven. Not when he sent his son. Not going to happen. There the righteous might dispute with him. So should I be delivered forever from my judge. I contend with you that this is what man today, today, reasons in his thoughts, in his heart, what he rationalizes today in his head. If there is a God, and if I must stand before him, I am certainly righteous enough to have earned his approval. After all, they tell me he's good, and I know I'm good. Therefore, if he's good, I'll be accepted. That's just man's reasoning. That was Cain's reasoning. 6,000 years ago. I'm going to bring this offering because, you know, I know what God told me to bring, but 
Listen, if, just, if he gives me five minutes, I'll explain this. <laughs> and God did not accept him. And because God did not, did not accept man for who he is, man turned right around and said, I'm not going to accept you for who you are. Say, well, turnabout's fair play. No, man's not God. He makes the rules. The owner makes the rules. We're going to talk about this on Sunday. God does not need you to accept him. You need him to accept you in the beloved. Or you can't be saved. So you can do all the accepting of Jesus you want. But if you don't come to him on his terms... He's not going to accept you. Right. One last place in Scripture, Romans chapter 10. We'll close there. Precursor for this weekend. Romans 10, look at uh, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. That was Paul's heart. It's inspired by the Spirit of God. I suspect it's God's heart. Right? So, without sounding blasphemous, hopefully, plug in your friend for Israel. Your neighbor, your co-worker, your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle, grandma, grandpa, mother, father, son, daughter. I pray that those who need to get saved would get saved. Amen. That should be our prayer. Verse 2. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So this world is filled with people that do have a zeal for a God or God. Yet lack the knowledge necessary to know Him for who He is. But presume, as did Job, to have known the eternal through finite knowledge, reason, and understanding. Verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. This is not just Israel's problem. This is not just Job's problem. This is a mankind problem. Always has been, and until the Lord returns and writes the ship, ever shall remain. So what I'm going to say now, I'm going to, I'm going to say it, with, it was with thought and with the intent to fully explain it this coming Sunday. Man will not go to hell because he's a sinner. Sinners will go to heaven. A man will not go to hell for rejecting Jesus. Man will go to hell for rejecting that Jesus is the only way to forgiveness. So I'm going to just take it a little further. It's not just trusting Jesus. I have to get rid of false worship. We're going to talk about that on Sunday. That's true repentance. Um, but right now, Job's problem is the sin of self-righteousness. It is that sin that will keep a man from hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate problem with this sin. Because I could have lived this sin my whole life and in a moment of repentance turned from my idolatry, which in America is yourself. Turned from my idolatry and repented toward God through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, then that sin of self-righteousness is just as covered as any other sin that I had committed, continue to commit, or ever shall commit until this 
corruptible puts on incorruption. Job is not only wrong about what he believes about his own good works, but he's dead wrong about how he believes God will answer him or judge the matter. He's dead wrong. Man is dead wrong. Mankind is going to come to the same conclusion. Better to get there now. Today. Today, if you will hear his voice, instead of, talk, instead of doing all the talking yourself. Today, if you'll hear his voice, like one crying in the wilderness, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. He's got a word. He's got a salvation. It's a perfect salvation. It just doesn't include your plan. <laughs> Are you okay that God didn't sit you down at the boardroom table in heaven and consult with you regarding the salvation of man? You're going to need to be okay with that. It wasn't your decision to make. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost made the decision as to how it was be done. The decision He's given you is will you believe it? That's it. All right. Father, I want to thank you uh, for the Word that we have uh, out of the book of Job tonight. I want to thank you for such a rich salvation, such a free salvation, such a powerful salvation. Lord, I want to pray that the people of this church would find joy in that salvation. Instead of hopping from amusement to amusement in search of some sort of joy, that they would go to the source of joy, salvation. And if that isn't their source, Lord, that they would pray, like David, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Lord, I pray that the people of Bible believers would come in here on Sunday and they'd be ready to sing your praises, to be excited about salvation, to be excited about a message they've heard over and over and over again. And for it never to grow weary, never to get tired of it, Lord. Help us in these carnal bodies to think spiritually. Beg that, even now in Jesus' name. Amen.